the door bursts open and five of these guys come out and literally bump into me. They start giving me a ration of crap. Now, I don't tend to take crap and I have 15 rounds plus 15 more. For a tenth of a second, I thought I could take all five of you out. But the point of the story is in our, in our world, the minute you draw your weapon, that, uh, that operation is done. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we have a phenomenal combat story with our first dedicated insight from a legendary CIA case officer, paramilitary operations officer, and senior leader, Enrique Rick Prado, who fought terrorists from the jungles of Central America with the storied Special Activities Division to event overseeing all agency operations at the helm of the Counterterrorism Center. Before joining the agency, Rick successfully completed the famed Pararescue or PJ Pipeline, but did not, despite multiple volunteer attempts, have the opportunity to fight in Vietnam. Instead, Rick would see plenty of operations and battles, but with the CIA, where he was operating as a solo paramilitary ops officer or PMOO in the Nicaraguan jungles in his first tour. Early in his career, Rick first came into contact with and was then mentored by some of the agency's giants like Kofor Black, Dewey Claridge, Bill Buckley, William Casey, and more. As you'll see during this interview, these are all names I know and revere, so I was starstruck hearing Rick's stories about these giants and just spending time with Rick, who many of these heavyweights consider one of the best CIA operators of his time. On 9-11, Rick was the Chief of Operations, or COPS, as the role is known inside the building, of the Counterterrorism Center, responsible for all counterterrorism operations for the whole CIA. After leaving the service, Rick founded a successful company where he continued to take the fight to the enemy and recently wrote a great book that gives a true behind the scenes look at the wide ranging, unpredictable and often dangerous life of a CIA operations officer. This is one of my favorite interviews to date and I hope you enjoy this peek behind the curtain of the premier covert intelligence organization from one of its legends as much as I did. Rick, thanks so much for taking the time to share your story with us today. Thank you for having me, Ryan. So um, as you and I were talking about just before we got started, uh, you are the first agency-specific person I've had on this podcast after 80-some interviews with veterans. And I think a lot of your story reads like you're a combat veteran, because you are, um, but in a different uniform in many cases. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks for, for bringing this new perspective. And I think along the way, we'll use new acronyms that our audience hasn't heard before. I might ask you to spell some of them out, even if I know some of them, just so that they can keep pace. But I thought, I thought we'd start with uh, the name Rick, which is what you go by. If you can kind of share where that came from. Yeah, when I first came uh, to the United States from Cuba, um, I, my, my friends were Americans and they could not say Enrique. They would say Enrique. So it became Ricky, and Ricky grew up, became Rick. So it's, it's that simple, but um, we're pretty benign. And you mentioned coming over from Cuba. I, we just can't even go forward, I think, without talking about your origin story. Um, what was that like when you came over? And could you share some of the context of what was going on and why you came from Cuba? Yeah, you know, uh, the revolution was roaring uh, in the late 1950s. Uh, Castro took over power in 59. Um, I lived in a small town of the foothills of some pretty good sized mountains in the central part of Cuba. And there was a lot of rebels there. Supposedly Che Guevara was one of the leaders. And uh, the town that I lived in was key for them because it was a good sized town at the foothills and they had a military and a police presence. So there were a couple of uh, raids and ambushes kind of attacks. Uh, and, you know, I, I witnessed, I heard several of them. Uh, I witnessed one of the, uh, when my parents were actually were out of town and I was there with a nanny. Uh, so I literally was two feet away from a soldier, well, a rebel that I had not seen. And he popped up and let off a whole magazine, an automatic weapon. I was maybe two feet away from him. And everything that I learned afterwards, you know, auditory exclusion, tunnel vision, everything was there. 
but uh, but that wasn't, I mean, that wasn't the shock. The real shock was two things after that. First, how quickly communism turned the country into what it is now. Uh, within six months, my dad, who had a small coffee roasting company, I think he employed 10 people during, during the harvest, um, was confiscated. Um, the, uh, the, the, and that was across the board. All private businesses were confiscated, uh, whether they were national or international. And most importantly, the oppression and the indoctrination. I remember the teachers telling us, um, if your family, anybody in your family talks bad about Fidel or the revolution, it's your duty, it's your patriotic duty to report to us. And some kids did. You know, there was actually cases where kids would dime their, their parents out because, you know, let's face it, especially back then, we still held teachers in, you know, in very high regard. And so they were, they were a hell of force. Um, first time I went to Havana um, with the intention of leaving Cuba, um, driving in, I saw three guys. I was eight years old, eight and a half, nine years old. And I saw three guys hanging from a tree, from different trees with signs on them that said counter revolutionaries. So that was kind of the persecution that was going on against anybody who was opposition or former this or that. Um, went from a fairly peaceful, fairly uh, robust country with a good economy. I mean, the US dollar and the Cuban dollar at the time, peso at the time were equal um, to what, what, what Cuba became. And uh, my parents couldn't get out. So they sent me um, by myself to the United States via a program called Pedro Pan, Peter Pan program by the Catholic Church. And I ended up in a wonderful uh, orphanage in Pueblo, Colorado in 1962, I turned 11 at the orphanage. No way. Um, just out of curiosity, what was the, I'm sure there are a lot of reasons for sending you, but what was the, the reason for your parents in particular to get you out of there? Freedom. You know, of, of all the lessons I have learned in my 71 years, the one that resonates the most is my dad's decision. I'm an only child. Imagine <laughs> taking your own child at age of 10 putting him on an airplane and you may never see him again. Wow. And we didn't do it. Definitely did not do it for financial reasons because we were solid middle-class. My dad had a 57 Pontiac, you know, we had a TV in the house and a telephone and we were sub poverty for the first three or four years in the United States. So um, when he saw that he and my mom could not get out yet, uh, they put me in this program. And I think that that is, the, big, the biggest badge of honor uh, and of love that you would make that sacrifice for, for freedom. And that's, I think that that's part of that. And though the experience that I just described were instrumental in me becoming who I became. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. And, and I know a lot of this is in the book behind your shoulder in, in black ops. And, and we're going to talk a lot about this. If you could just share um, what were you ever able to reconnect with your family? How, how did you even communicate with them when you're 11, 12 out on your own in this environment? Well, 1962, um, no texting, no emails. Nope. Uh, there was nothing. I, I did not even hear from my parents for eight months. Uh, luckily, they were some of the, the, the uh, lucky ones that were able to get out of the country. Uh, so I was there from early April to late October. Uh, when I got a phone call and it was my dad on the other line. And, you know, one thing that always resonated with me was uh, I was blessed with a very studly dad and a great, great, super good grandfather who were just real men. You know, the, the kind of people that, that, that I always have looked up to. And my dad, when, when I was at the airport getting ready to leave and my mom was crying, he grabbed me and he said, you have my word. I will see you again. And that's wow. what I mean. those eight months, that was, was what was steeled me to, to that adventure. Yeah. They were able to get out uh, in October. They went to Miami. It took a few weeks to get us them settled so enough that they, they, they would turn him back and turn me back onto them. And um, it was uh, my aunt, my cousin, my girl cousin, my mom and dad and me in a one bedroom. Uh, efficiency in a real crappy part of Miami. Wow. Our pets were roaches and uh, and rats. So. And starting over, I would assume. The American dream. 
Jeez. What, uh, what did the family do to, to make ends meet early on? Well, you know, my dad was, uh, luckily for him, uh, he was a craftsman. Uh, besides being a good businessman, he was a craftsman, especially wood. My dad was an artisan and he could make incredible stuff. Um, but the first probably several months, uh, he mowed lawns, he loaded trucks. Uh, my mom worked in a sweatshop making shirts in an unair conditioned warehouse in, in, in the Hialeah, I think it was, uh, for almost 10 years or about 10 years. So it was pretty rough go, um, but it was still a happy home. I mean, my mom and dad were the lovebirds. They always were. Um, and it was just a great reunion. I mean, in comparison to the, to the orphanage, um, I, I was, I was out doing the happy dance, you know? <laughs> um, was there a hatred of what you left behind in the government there? Or was it just, hey, this is the way of the world and now we have to move on? No, it's very personal. It's very personal. When, when you see your, your first country uh, destroyed and in, in, in families eviscerated, um, it becomes real personal. And I think that that's why some of my subsequent uh, adventures when I was actually fighting communism uh, were, were so gratifying to me. But uh, no, there's a, there's a lot of disdain. Um, it, it's personal. There, there isn't a Cuban family in the United States that doesn't have a story. And none of them are good. Uh, very few came over here for and ended up in a better life. I mean, in Miami in the 60s, you had lawyers and doctors working at the hotels in, in the beach because they spoke English. So uh, it was a very humble uh, re reconstruction. But at the end of the day, the best thing that ever happened to Rick Prado was Castro. Why, why do you say that? I'm an American. And I've served this country with honor. Both my kids are military. Um, uh, I, I pinch myself in the morning and go like, I am here because of the courage of my parents. And I'm in the best world, in the best country in the world. Yeah. At what point as you're growing up, Rick, do you start thinking like, all right, I want to go into a life of service? Or, and do you have any pushback from your family? Like you, you need to go and make money. Lord knows we don't make a lot in the government. Was there any, any uh, discussion? Where does that come from in your story? Well, there, there's, one, there's, there's one little vignette that actually got me started in that direction. I, I was a little rough grow, growing up, the high school years, you know, getting a lot of fights and stuff. I was never into dope, but we were into martial arts and lifting weights and getting in fights. You know, that was primarily what we did on the weekends and, and started chasing girlfriends. Um, and my parents uh, were really happy because my, you know, my, my draft number was so high, they were, they were sure that I, would not, uh, that I would not be drafted. And my first semester in junior college, Miami Day Junior College, the hippies announced that they were going to burn down the American flag, that they were going to take down the American flag and, and burn it. So I called a couple of my, my friends from, from the old days and um, when they, you know, these 15 hippies showed up, it was about five of us and the flag didn't come down, let's put it that way. <laughs> and, but you know, Ryan, that moment was the first time in my whole life that I was proud of being involved in any kind of violence. And that was the click. I understood what that flag stood for. I understood how good it felt to recognize that. And that became my debt of honor to this country in honor of my mom and dad. Do you um, at that point, do you start thinking about, well, maybe I do want to go over to this war or I want to sign up? Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, after that incident, six months later, I was uh, in pararescue or going into the pipeline for pararescue, Air Force pararescue. Uh, I went home on, um, I held it from my parents until like three weeks before. <laughs> and my dad almost knocked me out. My mom was on the floor, you know, crying and how could you? And, you know, and, and I just told him, I said, listen, you know, you, you've made your hard decisions. I'm making mine. And I, and I told him, I played it down. So I looked at, you know, I'm not going to go to Vietnam. Well, I wanted, I put in for Vietnam every single six months that I could. So they, they took it very hard. Uh, it was very rough on me because again, remember they already lost me once. So that was that that way yeah. very heavily on their mind the fact that hey, now first we had to send them off, now he is going off and, and, and into a very different environment that they didn't understand. Nobody in my family ever served even in a Boy Scout uniform, 
And when I got into pararescue, again, like, like most of my, my life has been pre, preordained, uh, I didn't know the difference between Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. I was in an oceanography class. I was studying to be a professional diver. And the guy in my class happened to be a, P, a PJ. And <laughs> we got to talk and he showed me this house. He showed me the photographs. I said, wow, I get to jump out of airplanes, climb mountains, do scuba, and wear a cool hat. Put me in, you know? So uh, the rest is history. Yeah. Oh, uh, late 1971, I went into the pipeline. And that is a long pipeline. We have had a PJ on here before to just talk through the pipeline. I don't know how much it's changed over time, but it's, it's a long one. But I don't know if there's one that gets you that much exposure to the coolest courses across the military. Yeah, you know, pararescue has a couple of advantages. First of all, pilots love us, which is always a good thing. In That's right. <laughs> but uh, the, um, you know, being a small, fairly small unit, when I was in pararescue, was never much more than 300 men. So we, we, the Air Force could afford to get us the best gear, the best training, and, and everything else. Um, it, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. And I thought I was fit, and I thought I was a tough kid until I got to the pipeline. It was humbling. Uh, after my, my third or fourth puke on a seven mile run, I said, well, you better, you, better, you, you better cowboy up on this one. And obviously I did and made it through. So just briefly before we jump into what comes next there, if you hadn't gone that route, the military route, what do you think you would have done in your life? You know, my, my dream, I, I read a lot. I, I was always a reader and, and everything from Edgar Rice Burroughs to James Bond novels and, and, and everything in between. And World War II OSS stuff always fascinated me. So that was always in the back of my mind, but I had nothing that would crystallize that into a dream because I didn't know anybody yeah. anywhere in, in, that, in that fraternity. And uh, so I was going to be a professional diver. Jack, Jacques yeah. Cousteau was my, my, my dream uh, hero. Um, me being of the Calypso, diving for treasures in the Mediterranean was what I wanted to do yeah. uh, until life, life intervened and put some sanity into my brain. I mean, you still ended up with a very expeditionary type uh, career, I would say, um, as we talk through this. I would not trade my life for anything. So if we talk about coming out of the pipeline, where do you go from there? Well, I came out of the pipeline. I ended up at Homestead uh, in 74. I put in to the agency. Uh, they wrote me a very nice letter back saying we're firing, not hiring. These are atrocious years for, for, the, for most of U.S. government, especially including the military. Um, and so I went and read, worked for um, Miami Metro, Dade County uh, Fire Department as a paramedic. Obviously being a PJ, I was already an EMT too. And they were just starting their, their program. Again, the Prado Luck, the captain, of the fire department's rescue was a former PJ. Or <laughs> AP, actually, we were in the same unit. So I rode rescue in Miami in the 70s uh, for six and a half years. Um, we didn't talk about Bay of Pigs. Did that, earlier on in your life, did that come up, like you discuss it with the family? Was that just a huge discussion point around the community? You know, that, that I was in Cuba for that. Um, I was actually still in Cuba when the Bay of Pigs happened. That was part of the tipping point, getting my dad to finally say, you know, this, this isn't going to change. Yeah. Uh, and lucky for me in my career with the agency, I got to meet quite a few of the Americans. Oh, my gosh. That were part of those programs. Yeah. And also several of the Cubans, you know, that were like Felix Rodriguez and, you know, Amado and all these guys who were actually Bay of Pig veterans that went on to have illustrious careers with us. So I've, I've gotten the intel back and forth. I have that pretty bit. It is, again, like the whole Cuban revolution thing is very personal because it, yeah. it was the last hope for the people that were on the island. Oh, geez. Okay. So you mentioned that you put in a packet for the agency and they politely declined. What on earth made you put in a packet there? Uh, again, I just uh, felt that I wasn't doing anything. Uh, I, I joined the military to go to Vietnam. And yeah, rappelling and scuba jumps and all that is a lot of fun. But I wanted a purpose driven life and training for training's sake after a while it gets old. So uh, again, riding rescue, I stayed in the reserves. As a matter of fact, I, I did uh, 
three years with the 20th Special Forces out of Fort Lauderdale. I did not go through the Q course. Um, I was waiting to go through the Q course, but I was already, you know, scuba qualified and all the other stuff. So I was on the green team. And I decided again in around 1980 to reapply. And this time they said, hmm, we could use a, 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 a medic with your background to work with Special Activities Division Ground Branch. And it was part time. Uh, it was, you know, going for two weeks and three weeks or whatever. Uh, and it was definitely contract. It wasn't a staff thing. And um, come Reagan, uh, he decides he's going to clean up our backyard from communism. And he mandated the covert action program that came to be known as the Contra program, trying to dethrone the communist Sandinistas who, who were, you know, proxies of Cuba, who was proxies of the Soviet Union. So um, believe it or not, at that time, the agency did not have a native Spanish speaking, Hispanic looking guy. Come on, Rick. His skills. And he was like, oh, yeah. where was that Cuban kid? Uh, by the PJ, remember? You know, I was Go dig through kid. the pile, get that paper. They, they tracked me down and wow. uh, first PJ to, to, to enter Ground Branch. Is that and, right? Um, wow. Yeah. So just for people who are listening, some of them will know what Ground Branch is and SAD. Could you just share a little bit about, uh, as much as, as we're able to share, obviously, I know I could just say for people, like incredible reputation within the agency, but what a paramilitary officer is in that part of the, uh, the yeah. agency, if you could share that. Yeah, you know, until recently, the agency was divided in geographical areas, and they were called divisions. You had East Asia Division, Latin America Division, and so on and so on. There was one division that was not geographical, and that was Special Activities Division. And all the, all the names and titles of all the branches and groups come from the OSS days. Uh, they, they kept that sacrosanct. So uh, Ground Branch was mostly the infantry component of Special Activities Division. Special Activities Division is the Special Operations Forces for the CIA. That's, that's basically what they are. They, we all come from what is now SOCOM uh, kind of uh, backgrounds, you know, uh, Raiders and SEALs and, and, and a lot of Green, green Berets, of course. So um, that that's 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 kind of describes it. Uh, it it's still a uh, now it's called a center, um, but it's still part of the structure is very similar. And then they've got an air and maritime component, that's right, correct. to kind of round it out, which you're saying is a carryover from the original. Exactly, and they come under a special operations group, which again is a, a right. direct moniker from OSS, and then the uh, the uh, special activities. Yeah. That's great. Okay, so. So you kind of come into this shadowy world. Are you able to tell anybody at that time what you're doing or is it completely under the radar for your whole family? No, I, I, um, my, I told my dad um, where, where I was going, no further details. Um, told my mom that I was doing something for the military, uh, which was credible for them. Um, uh, they did not know that I was in Honduras, Nicaragua. Um, I could barely write to them. Um, yeah, would, we would I literally have to wait till somebody was leaving Honduras for us to give them a, a, a letter because we were there in aliens. So I was there, I, I wasn't in true name, so I couldn't send out anything to what well, was yeah. my family matronymic and patronymic. So um, yeah, it, it was pretty pretty close hold. Uh, I had started dating my wife, my, my, my current wife. I, I was married for a short time first. And uh, she's the other one that I, you know, uh, told her what, 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 what I was all about. So I will say just um, from the very short time I spent there, not as long as you by any means, the people who try to hide it from their spouse are usually in for a rude awakening. Um, but you, you really have to share it with a lot with, with some other people. You had to keep a close hold as well. Did you, so you told your father you were going to work at the agency. You just didn't share where you were going. What was his reaction to that? You know, my, my dad understood me. Um, uh, his his anger at me was because of my mom, uh, what he was doing to my mom. But he he knew how what I was wired for. He knew that it, sooner or later I would have been doing something of that ilk. Um, and he was supportive, but he was worried. He, he was worried. I remember we were watching a, a movie, a Chuck Norris movie, uh, before I left, and he looked at me. He says. Is that what you're going to be doing? And I go, so dad, no, man, that's Hollywood. You know, don't worry about it. You know, I just, I'm going to be doing training primarily, you know, from all that stuff that I learned in pararescue. So 
he rolled his eyes and went with it, you know, and uh, the, the problem was later on when I was under State Department cover and in true name, uh, I was in, in countries that my mom was an avid reader and she knew what was going on in every country that I ever set foot in after that. So, <laughs> um, so much for that for belief. Got it. Um, if you can then share that first time you go on one of your rotations as a PMOO, um, as much as you can share, obviously, what, um, what was the type of work like so that people can get some context of, of what it's like going in alias into another country? Like what type of work, um, how dangerous was it as much as you can share? Yeah. You know, um, they recruited me on a, they called me on a Thursday and I was at headquarters on a Monday doing really in, in, in polygraphs. I wrote a letter to my police chief said, I'm leaving um, after six years. And uh, I had just gotten divorced from, from my first marriage a few months before. So I was a hang, angry young man and made me very fit. I was in pretty good shape. And, and I was late, like I said, the, the following Monday I was at headquarters and two weeks later I was in Honduras in alias, no training, no training whatsoever other than, uh, you know, a little bit about the, 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 the situational, uh, you know, the political, the geopolitical aspects of where I was going. And basically they told me, he says, you're going to have a good boss. He's going to tell you what to do. Just do it. So it's moving. And uh, I literally, that's, that's how it started. Um, I, for the, I, I was there for a little over three years supporting the Contras. Um, and for the first 14 months of that program, I was the only CIA officer allowed in the camps because the American hand was still being hidden. Thus the name Black Ops for, for the book, yeah. it, it tries to describe the fact that, as you know, most of our work is done at night in the dark and then you have the covert action aspect of our careers, which are, that are meant to be kept in the dark. So um, I, I was in Honduras. Uh, I literally lived in the camps with the Contras from Monday to Friday uh, for a little over three years, um, sleeping in a jungle hammock and, and loving every part of it. And, you know, I, I, I've had a blessed career. But Ryan, there was something so rewarding for me because I saw what communism did to my family as a, as a child, you know, in, in, into my first country. And I couldn't do anything about it. I was 10 years old. Now I'm 30 years old and I am the focal point on this program on the ground. And we're helping these, these men and women uh, uh, kick butt. And there's a lot of bad press that surrounds the whole Contra program. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with it the political, the later political ramifications of which, of course, were like, thin, you know, a thousand feet above my pay grade. Um, but the people that I work with and the men and women that I met at those camps were the most rewarding relationships I ever had. Uh, every single one of them was there for a higher motive, not political, not even ideological. It was strictly freedom, family, God, and country. You stole some of my questions I was going to ask. I was, uh, you got right to the heart of it, which is great. I mean, I, I think back to like 2008 when I was in Afghanistan in the army and this idea in my mind, like, all right, now I'm able to take the fight back to these people when I couldn't do anything in the past. And you clearly had that ability when it was so close to home for you early on. Um, for people who have only seen the Chuck Norris movies and the Mission Impossibles, and they think you're going out on a solo raid every night to go capture somebody in their sleep. Um, could you share just a little bit more about um, maybe some of the work or like, were, were you going on direct actions? Were you working more um, logistics in the background just to give people some context of what it was like for you day to day? Yeah, uh, day in the life kind of stuff. I, I, I would leave uh, four o'clock in the morning on Mondays because at first uh, we had to go by truck. We didn't have helicopters very early on. So it was a you know, six, seven, eight hour ride to, to, to whatever we were going. Uh, and I would spend those five days primarily training uh, them, bringing them the logistics. Uh, I learned how to teach uh, headspace and timing on a 50 cal. I learned, I, I became a damn good RPG uh, <laughs> shooter. I must have shot, I probably shot 20 or 30 of those during the, the, the training phases. Um, 
and I live with the Contras. I, I ate with the Contras. And on two or three occasions, I had to fight with the Contras. Not because I was being proactive. I wasn't going out on raids. Um, but, you know, you're, you're in contested territory. You're in areas where there, it's not like there's a fence or a wall. Um, you're mas o menos in Honduras or mas o menos in Nicaragua, you know. And um, the, the first, first time uh, that, that I heard shots fired in anger, or I should say that I shot back in, in anger, um, I had gone to Suicida's camp and I had a truckload of mortars and mortar rounds that I was supposed to train them on. And I had been training on that back in, at, uh, at Tegucigalpa. And as soon as we parked our truck, there was, there, there was an, a Sandinista com, uh, camp not too far from us, but they, had, they, had, they were there in ambush. And uh, they opened up on us. Um, we fired back, we pushed them back. And, um, you know, it was the first time that my, my training really kicked in. Um, you know, it wasn't, you know, spray and pray. I, you know, <laughs> I watched my ammo, I, you know, yeah. I, I, I was aiming, all this kind of stuff that um, only comes through drilling and drilling and drilling with that adrenaline really hits. So what I did was I, I told uh, the commander that I was that I was there was the most one of the most aggressive commanders in the north, and I said, um, tomorrow we are going to have a class on the mortar, and you know what our target's going to be that camp, and uh, we leveled the camp. So it was very gratuitous. They never came back. They never came back to that AO. So that that was my first scrape. But you know my whole existence down there was that um, going to the camps. What do you need? You know, the first time I set foot in one of those camps, it was the most humbling thing I've ever seen in my life. These kids awesome. cut off shorts, flip flops, uh, eight, uh, uh, three, you know, 308 uh, Mauser bolt action rifles, a uh, couple of rusty AKs taken from, from Sandinistas from scrimmages, um, you know, ankle deep in mud, no medical supplies, barely food supplies. So I became, you know, their, 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 their conduit for all of that. I immediately went back. I took a lot of photographs and um, those were sent up right straight uh, to the DCI for, 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 for briefings. And, uh, you know, I saw those camps grow and grow to where towards the end, you know, we had 50, 50 cows for air defense and we had, uh, you know, thousands of guys going in at any given time, um, fully equipped. And I think it's worth pointing out, and please provide more context here, Rick. But at that time, early 80s, I mean, full-on Cold War, obviously Moscow is an important place in the world. But outside of that, like you were fighting the front lines of the Cold War. Like that was a huge focal point for the U.S. government at that time. No, I mean, the, the fighting in Central and South America. Yep. Yeah, you know, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, the Soviet Union would supply Cuba as a surrogate, and they had fomented the problems in Nicaragua. They were from there, they were going to El Salvador, obviously El Che in, in Bolivia. Uh, so it was rampant. It was rampant expansion uh, at the time. And and for, for me on the ground, of course, the geopolitics, hell, I didn't have a radio to listen to <laughs> what was out there. Um, I, I would try to catch up with my reading on, on the weekends, but... Um, it was it was very uh, important to the agency also, Ryan, because it posed Vietnam attrition. It became the first successful uh, black operations, covert action operation, because we did force after several years the Sandinistas into the negotiating table because they were getting their asses kicked yeah. uh, towards the end there. And even though they were getting you know Heinz and you know they had the the seventeens there for a while. Um, our guys were knocking them out of the air. There, our guys were just just taking them over, and the the population was also very friendly to the Contras and not so much to the Sandinistas. So, they went to the negotiating table. They had to agree to have democratic, supervised elections, something that everybody should have. And <laughs> um, you know, they they were they were thrown out of power temporarily, but it, they, they, our our job was complete and it was successful. We when you came out of that first uh, skirmish, as you described it, the first contact that you had, you know, you had mentioned, I guess it was eight or more years earlier that you had 
kind of gone into the military to go to Vietnam. You didn't get the chance to go downrange. Now you're doing this. Did you feel like, like this kind of um, completed that or gave you the chance that you didn't have before? It's arguably one of the best days of my life. Yeah, because, you know, um, we, we can do all the training. Uh, I've been in the martial arts since I was 15 years old. You could do all that ninja stuff. But until you're literally getting incoming rounds and you're putting downrange rounds, you don't know how you're going to react. Uh, so that, that's just the reality of life. Um, I am proud of the fact that I was able to keep my cool. The Parker factor was there. Um, but it was very, a very important day for me because I lost my cherry. You yeah. know, it was like, okay, now I can say that I've been in harm's way for real, not just in the periphery. And we had a couple of other little incidents, you know, uh, uh, after that, but, uh, and a couple of operations that I got into, which we can, we'll, we'll address later. Yeah. Uh, and, and I guess I, I almost feel sad that you didn't have another person there to talk to about it, but you, you certainly had the camp and, and the yeah. folks that you were fighting with, they probably became like brothers and sisters, I would assume. Without a doubt. Uh, there's, there's even a couple of them that I'm still in touch with. Uh, Mike wow. Lee. And, um, Luis Moreno, he, he became arguably the most successful commander that the FDN had. Uh, he lives in, in, in Jacksonville and we're, we're on email and we've talked on the phone. Um, so yeah, I mean, when, when you eat with these people, fight with these people, sleep with these people, and also remember that, like I said, for the first 14 months, I was the guy, I was Santa Claus. I yeah. was the guy that brought bringing the everything in and showed them how to use them. And, and uh, it was very rewarding. I was I felt, always felt appreciated. They, take good, they took good care of me. Um, but um, yeah, it was a brotherhood. And I did have people to, to, to talk to. Now, I did not tell them that it was my first firefight. <laughs> there's no need to be that upfront. No, no yeah. because, well, because there's a credibility issue there. You yeah. know, I was supposed to be a seasoned somebody. And I was a seasoned somebody. It's just I had never shot somebody or somebody that. Would shoot me. You know, um, and I know I, I don't want to jump too far ahead here, but just for people to have some context, if we fast forward to 9-11, correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, you're cops CTC at the time. So you're like in a very strategic, important place in time. But the question I want to ask is for that first three years where you're living in these camps downrange on the front lines, how did that experience influence how you made decisions when you were, you know, a cop CTC, a general officer equivalent later on? You know, it's, it's, uh, it was a great molding. It was a great grooming grounds for me because first of all, I was blessed with a fantastic boss, uh, Colonel Ray. I, I, I don't say his last name. He, we lost him a few years ago, but he was a legendary guy. He jumped into Corregidor when he was 18. <laughs> Uh, was Green Beret and what was our men in Laos with, you know, uh, uh, well, Bill Buckley, him and Bill Buckley were, you know, surgically attached to the hip. And um, he, he was my mentor. I mean, he was my guide. He was my friend. He was my, uh, you know, my, my war, my, my sea daddy, you know, and um, I learned a lot from him. But, you know, there's certain lessons that you learn and some of it are things like team cohesion, uh, the importance of team cohesion. Um, the importance of sweating the details. Uh, there was a lot of times when guys would come back that I would chastise them because you, you should have done better than this or you should have known that. So um, I, I think it was a great molding ground and also the autonomy, right? I mean, I, I had yeah. no adult supervision for those first 14 months. And actually, matter of fact, after that in the camps, I still didn't have supervision because those guys were actually junior to me by that time that I would actually be making the rounds to the camps and, you know, and, 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 and dividing things. I ended up doing most of the Mosquitia stuff because I was always, that, that was one of my favorites and I had a great relationship. Stedman Fagath, who is the, uh, the leader, was the leader of uh, Bisura Sata, Mosquito Sumo Rama, the three Indian tribes in the, in the East. I'm in touch with him. I talked to him on the phone maybe two months ago. <laughs> Jeez. Now, during that, that time, those first three years, as you're kind of learning and, and moving around the camps, do you get a taste of the, the human side as opposed to the, not that PMOs don't do that, but more of the traditional running sources? Are you exposed to that at that time? 
a little because I was working back at, at when I was in Tegucigalpa, the rest of the guys were working with the local service and they were working with you know, our, our FDN. So by so much Moses and again, some, some teaching, you know, guys like Ray and a couple of other guys that would pull me aside and say, hey, this is, you know, this is what I'm doing. I'm meeting with this guy as a clandestine meeting. He's the one that provided me this information. But I personally did not get involved in, in anything. But the other thing that I did learn that was that, that helped me a lot with the agency and, and, and it was I had I had street savvy. I was a street savvy kid True. and I've never had an ego. I've never I've never allowed that of myself. And uh, it, it saved my life because there was I was in one of the camps that uh, had gone. The commander had been killed and um, the two guys who took over went rogue and which was an anomaly. But nonetheless, when that was reported to the Honduras, they looked at us and said, you got to go clean it up. So uh, they sent me to to the camp uh, to, uh, to to clean it up. And uh, it's all in the book, but the, you know, the Reader's Digest version of it is the first guy met me at the drop zone at the, at the, uh, at the helo pad, um, empty field, not, you know, not our standard helo pads. <laughs> and, um, you know, he was there with his bodyguard and I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. And I threw him in the, in the, in the helicopter and he went off with a, a Honduran captain and I stayed with two <laughs> of the uh, Nika uh, uh, commanders that were with me. And uh, so we're walking into, in, into the, the camp now. We were at the outskirts of the camp where there's a little like 10 building village. We were walking into the camp and uh, I could see two kinds of people looking at me, some with gratefulness and others with evil eyes. You know, and, and I mean, I knew what had been going on. I mean, they had raped women. They were they had stolen cattle. It was pretty uh, egregious. And. I'll never forget it. I'm walking down uh, the, uh, there's a brush here and all of a sudden I hear psst, psst, major, major. And it was this young kid, probably 19 years old, who three, four months before had come to me. My wife is very sick. I need to get some antibiotics. I didn't know anything about case officers getting refunded for that. I just went in my pocket, gave him $20 worth of Lampitas. And, and he's the one that told me, he says, sir, they, they have to kill you. They, they want to kill you tonight. Wow. So uh, we, um, in th the first clue was they usually would put me, I told you earlier on, they, they took very good care of me. So I usually was at the center of the camp where, you know, the commanders were. Well, this time they put me and my guys in some hooch on, on the uh, upper side of, of, the, uh, of the camp. Rick, this is you and two guys rolling into this camp and you just... Oh man. All right. Yeah. Keep going. This is crazy. <laughs> True story. Yeah. Uh, so what, what we did was again, you know, it, it's, I, I, the one thing that I have learned in my career and it's Sun Tzu 101, the best fight is the one that you never have to fight. And uh, so I'm, we're in the room, I'm briefing my Nikas. I'm going to go, Hey guys, you know, this is, this is what they told me. We got to play it safe. So as soon as it got dark, we went out the window. There was a, there was a pretty good sized hill in front of us full of rocks. We set up at the, at the top of the hill, put down a perimeter. I had grenades. I always carry a couple with me. And uh, we took turns, sure as hell, right around midnight. Here comes these guys into the hooch with flashlights, flat, you know, all this kind of stuff. And we're all there on the ready, you know, fire discipline. We got our, our, our lanes and everything else. Um, because it's not like we could DD Mao out of there. It was not like we can escape and evade from there. But we're in the middle of the jungle somewhere, you know, where are we going to go? And uh, they know that area better than I do, for sure. So we just sweated it out and we waited and they, we could hear the cursing and everything else. And they went back and in the morning I showed up like nothing's happened. What? Just like nothing had happened. So I, I we, we, yeah, we make it to the camp and now we're having breakfast. And again, there's, there's people looking at me and smiling and there's other people going like, you know, because they knew what I was there to do. So I, I, I had a meeting with the commanders. I said, where is Caramalo? Caramalo was the second guy and he was in town. And I said, uh, where is he? He said, well, he's in such and such a town because now some of the people that are friendly to, to us and were against what was going on were coming clean. They were pulling me aside and, and giving me the, the information. So that was free Intel, but it was still Intel collection. And so the helicopter came back and picked me up that morning with the same uh, uh, Honduran captain and my two Nikas. And we went 
to the town, landed in, in, the, in the center of the town with a helicopter. And there were six policemen um, from, the, uh, from that little town. I mean, we're talking 18 year old pimple faced kids with, you know, with rifles and they yeah. make a circle around the helicopter. And, and I asked them, I asked that uh, they had a, uh, I think it was a sergeant or a lieutenant, I don't recall. I said, do you know where Cara de Malo is? He says, yeah, he's at the whorehouse down there. You know, he's, uh, I said, send two guys and tell them that Major Alex is here and needs to talk to him now. So he, I'm sitting there, I'm about 20 yards in front of the helicopter. Luke is behind me, the captain is behind me. And um, here he comes in a Jeep. And I'll never forget, it was an orange Jeep with his driver. He gets out of the, and it was something that he took from one of the locals. It was that kind of uh, mafia shut. And uh, he starts walking forward. I could, I could smell the liquor as, as soon as he got within 10 feet of me. And I had my AR-15 slung over my shoulder. And I told him, I said, look, Caramelo, uh, you've known me for well over two years. You know that I'm guaranteeing your safety, but you need to go back and you need to get debriefed on what's allegedly going on in here. And he says, well, I ain't going. And I said, well, it, it wasn't really a, a question if you wanted to go. I'm telling you that you have to come with me. So he goes like this, he looks back and the, the driver reaches under and grab, brings out an Uzi. And I just took my, my AR from my shoulder, pointed it at his groin and click, took the safety off. And I go, you know, I can shoot and you know, you're gonna go down first. You better tell your guy to put that gun back. So he went back and did one of these, put it down, put it down. And, and I told him, I said, look, you have my word for your, of your safety. You will be heard out, but you have to get on this helicopter. And so we got him in the helicopter. I disarmed him, gave the weapons to the pilots, and we flew him back. Jeez. How old were you then, Rick? Like 30? 31, 31 32. You know, it's I, I, <laughs> I often talk to people who are who ask about the military and then the agency. And there's just some things you do in the agency you can never predict. And I just think it would take so long in the military to have that type of autonomy. Like somebody just said, hey, 31 year old, go hop on this aircraft and go talk two guys out of this plan that they have and have them come back safely. And hopefully you make it, you know, it's just amazing the amount of autonomy you get. Yeah. And, and as you know very well, you know, we, we are solo operators for the most part. Yeah. I mean, in war theaters, we do have our, our GRS guys who help us out, who are essential, love them to death, our, our surveillance guys and gals that I love to death. But 99% of our work is done by ourselves in the dark. Yeah. So where do you go after those first three years? Have you said like, hey, I've had enough of this? I mean, I don't think so, because I think you're a PMO for like 10 years. Right? Yeah. yeah, I was, I was, I was uh, uh, ground branch based um, for, for my first 10, 11 years of my 24. But uh, what happened was, um, again, my mentor, Dewey Claridge, which at the time legendary wow. Dewey Claridge, um, he met me when he came down to, uh, or, sorry, I met him when he came down with uh, Bill Casey in, in a black. Oh my car. gosh, Rick, stop. So, <laughs> yeah. I, he, these are legends for people who don't know. 10, these right? are legends. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, I mean, Bill Casey is the best DCI we've ever had. And he was a real OSS guy kind of thing. And Dewey Claridge, um, he didn't do much. He only created like the counter-terrorist center and, you know, chief L LA division. But anyway, so I'm in the camps and I get a, a, a call, not a call, a radio call, one-time pads. We actually were using OTPs to communicate and said, get your ass back to, to town. Which Sorry, was Rick, real quick. Could you explain what a, a, an OTP is just real quick? Yeah, they, they're from World War II, again, mostly OSS base. And they're these cards that you have a set and I have a matching set. And then it's numbers and numbers with letters. So you, you know, I'll, I'll dictate three, four, 17, five, nine, two. It means, hey, send me this or send me that, whatever. And uh, very, you know, you, you, you learn to write very succinct. <laughs> it's almost like the old telegraph of the yeah. West. You know, you, you get charged by the, by the letter. Yeah. And uh, so I show up at, head, you know, at our, our Estado Mayor. And of course, I'm in my, my battle rattle stuff. And there is Dewey Claridge with his pressed chino pants and his $300 hunter vest, you know, and smoking, you know, a Cuban cigar the size of a sausage. And uh, he looks at me, and Colonel Ray introduces me to, to, uh, to him. And he said, yeah, I'm this, I'm the head of the task force for this stuff. 
he, he went on to be the division chief also, but he uh, introduces me to Bill Casey. And he says, uh, Mr. Director, this is Major Alex. He's your man in the camps. You talk about, I'm, you know, I'm a GS-10 talking to the DCI. And he looked at me, he says, Alex says, I love your pictures. I keep them on my desk. And it says, and every time I have some liberal trying to talk me out of this here, I use them to beat them over the head with the images that you have sent us. Keep them coming because I will keep on using them. And from that day on, Dewey Claridge always knew my name. And as a matter of fact, a few times at the beginning when I was back in the building, he seen me in the halls, he goes, hey, Alex, I go, a Rick, you know, because that's how he met me as Alex Mendez. But uh, yeah. Oh, man. And so you knew these people by reputation at that time. Do, Dewey, well, I knew them. I, I knew of Dewey um, at the moment. I mean, my, my yeah. boss was like, this is who you're talking about. This is the DCI. And of course, I knew that the DCI was, uh, was Casey. Um, I did not know about Dewey, but uh, Dewey and I were friends and even worked together after the agency. I, I did some special programs for him and um, great loss, but one of the great, greatest men I ever met and, and a real mentor to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've wondered, slight segue here. Um, you mentioned you show up and he's in his press chinos and his hunter vest. And um, there's, for people who haven't been inside the agency, there's a certain um, reputation or demeanor for different geographic yep. areas. Like, could you just share a little bit about LA division, Latin America division? Right? Yeah, you know, but, but you know, Dewey broke all molds anyway. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, 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 at that time, a lot of it was Ivy League-ish kind of stuff. And, you know, people dress well, you know, coat and tie is, is the uniform of headquarters. Even if you're a paramilitary officer, yep. you're, you're still, you know, you're, you're wearing that garb. And, uh, you know, Latin America has this culture, European, UR has their culture besides the language. Um, but the, the dress code was pretty standard, except for Dewey. Dewey wore Brioni suits with silk handkerchiefs hanging out of the, uh, you know, and, um, and he, was, he, was a, he was a bigger than life uh, guy. I, I, I even told him later on when, when I got to know him really, really well, uh, working together for two or three years when he was in San Diego. Uh, I told him, I said, Dewey, you know, when I first saw you, you, remind, you reminded me like the good version of a real bad guy. And he, who's that? And um, geez, I'm having a senior moment right now. It's the, the, the bad guy in Thunderball. Um, I can't remember the guy, but it was that kind of a guy, you know, yeah, yeah. wore the, you know, the jacket over his shoulders, not with the sleeves in it. <laughs> and always had the big, you know, the big ring and the, and the cigar sticking out. Uh, and and uh, I'll think of the guy's name. But I, and I told him, and he laughed. He goes, oh, well, at least you said the good guy. But he, because he had that flair, that panache that he, that, in the way of dressing. So, um, yeah, I mean, us in the field, uh, depending on your cover, you wear different, different. Uh, yeah. You know, and then, of course, when, when we do our work, we try to blend in. I, I think that that is the number one thing people do not understand, that when we are operational, uh, you're not wearing ninja suits. You know, you have, you know, you, you are carrying a weapon, but it's got to be really concealed and you're, you're doing your stuff. It has to be credible. And, and, the, and the goal is never to draw your weapon. Yeah. Oh, man. So, so Dewey is kind of looking out for you going forward. Where do they move you to next? Yeah, he, he was instrumental in getting me into Ground Branch uh, permanently. Uh, they, they, had, they had told Colonel Ray, yeah, yeah, we're going to take care of him. He didn't believe him. So he called Dewey. And Dewey called the division chief in, in the SAD and said, uh, you got two hours to bring a Prado on board or I'm taking them to a Latin America division. Wow. And they said, no, no. Because you were a contractor, plan. you said, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. absolutely. So, um, and I went through the farm, uh, went through, got my master's in espionage. <laughs> and um, I had a, a follow-on assignment almost immediately. I was supposed to go to El Salvador. And I say supposed to because my household goods were already in El Salvador. And I was freshly married by, you know, we had a, a, a little, you know, six or seven month old or, well, maybe he was about a year and a half by then, uh, the son, our oldest son. And uh, all of a sudden I get called by the division chief. Uh, Jerry calls me up and he goes, um, the chief of station in Costa Rica has asked for you by name. And he says, that's, that's Joe Fernandez. And I had met Joe in Honduras. He, you know, 
the legendary Joe Fernandez, another, I mean, I was blessed. Uh, I, I think I only had one alpha hotel boss in the, all the 24 years I had. <laughs> And, and he didn't last long, uh, luckily, but um, Joe was the quintessential. And I earned my, my, uh, my trade craft and my reports writing and my operational acumen under his tutelage. He was just the most incredible boss I ever had. And, uh, but anyway, he had asked for me by name to run wow. the Southern Front uh, in, of, of the Contra program. Now, we're talking 1986 uh, through 88. Um, yeah. And now I'm out of Costa Rica. And you talk about a stark contrast. You know, Honduras was a bastion of support. They provide, they helped us with everything, facilitated everything. We, we, pay, we paid our way through, but they were there. They provided me with my cover. I was there as a Honduran major. You know, everything was hunky-dory. In Costa Rica, the Costa Ricans were actually trying to ca capture us because they did not want to get sideways with the Sandinistas they wanted to show that they're a neutral country. So I went from going to the camps with AR-15s and grenade in my pocket to a Browning high power in, in, my, in, my, in my back and uh, going to meetings with these Contras uh, to, to do the same thing, try to get them out for training, give them the intelligence, give, give, them, uh, give them the guidance. So uh, while, they said, while they were trying to, you know, the, the service, the local service was trying to arrest us. So we were doing things like, you know, I, I bought a van with air conditioning and I would have a car do a pickup of these individuals somewhere and then do a surveillance detection route to me in the van. And then that person would drive the van and I would go in the back of the air conditioned van and, and, and have the meetings. So uh, quite a contrast, more, you know, like a mini French resistance versus yeah. you know, uh, behind the lines. Yeah. So this was more of more of a, I mean, you're still a PMO, but a bit more of a traditional environment. Right. And I guess for people listening, when we say traditional, I think for people who've been inside the agency, the traditional route is you're out in another country, operating undercover, meeting sources, getting information, bringing it back, as opposed to what you just described in Nicaragua uh, as a PMO living in camps, um, kind of sometimes in skirmishes, which is the exception rather than the rule. So you had more of a traditional, and there you said your reports writing and you kind of learned the fundamentals of that side of the business in that in that tour. Absolutely. I mean, I made my first uh, two or three recruitments. Um, you know, oh, wow. Under, under, uh, under Joe's guidance. Look, you know, we, we have one advantage in the agency that we are seen as the guys with the white hats. You know, the, 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 the US government in countries that are fighting for the freedom, know we are the only ticket. So it's a lot easier to recruit for strengths as we do than what some of our opposition does, which is recruit for, for weaknesses. Could so, you explain that, Rick, just for people who don't know what that means, the strengths and weaknesses in recruiting yeah, someone? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's actually pretty, pretty basic. I mean, you know, um, the strengths are people that are morally and ideologically compatible with what we believe in. So, you know, you, you, you're, you're in this country, uh, let's say we had people working in Nicaragua uh, in, out of the embassy at the time. Well, they're out there recruiting Nicaraguans to help them find out what the hell is going on. Um, but these people understand that dealing with this American and spying for this American, you're not betraying your country, you're trying to save your country. And that's, Again, I, I know it's over romanticized and, and there, there, are, there are warts here and there, but nonetheless, that is our strength. The opposite is what most communist bloc countries practice. And that's, you know, Russia and the satellites, including Cuba and the Chinese, is they will recruit for weaknesses. In my 24 years, I never saw a recruitment for weaknesses. As a matter of fact, uh, we would have uh, sources that were recruited that then afterwards, we noticed that they had a uh, drinking problem and we would get them, we would get them help. We would actually get them off, off the juice. And uh, so th that's the contrast, you yeah. know, the, the Russians and the Cubans, for example, um, they would put something in your drink and uh, you're, you're dead asleep in your room. They'll bring in two la naked ladies, take photographs and send them to your wife. If, mm -hmm. if you don't, if you don't cooperate, um, you know, the story of the Marine in Moscow, who, you know, walked his girlfriend into, into the station spaces, you know, um, that's the kind of stuff that they do. So that's the contrast for us. Um, gosh, 
where to go from here. So you're in Costa Rica, you have your first recruitment. That's a big deal for a lot of people. I mean, yeah, it, it's kind of like your first time in combat. Can you just talk through what it felt like after having achieved that and how hard it was to do? Um, for people who don't know, recruitments can be quick sometimes, but usually they're very long and difficult. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the usually six seven months is, is probably minimum of, of the time that you spend developing somebody, getting to know them, getting to trust you. Uh, a, a part that people do not understand is that here I am, I'm, I may be a GS-13 in Costa Rica, but I am trying to recruit, and I did, a very senior government official, you know, um, because, you know, you, you, I, the, the, the saying that I've always used is you can't pitch somebody from the catcher's mouth. You have to have like that. that elevation of, okay, look, I am this, I am former this, I'm a U.S. diplomat. And in conversations with the, your developmental, you're building your credibility based on your world experience that they often lack. So once the person is looking up to you for these things that I am trying to find out what makes them tick, most importantly, what keeps them up at night? When you can find out what keeps somebody up at night and you could provide a solution, that's a viable recruitment. I love that. That's super interesting. Did this change your personal demeanor or way of living at all? The kind of the, the way you started understanding how people worked? You know, um, no. I mean, we, we have a saying, don't case officer at home uh, or in the building. Uh, and, and we try to live by that, although, the, the, you know, the, the, the craft is the craft. But, uh, you know, I, I uh, growing up, I, I, I worked in a very nice clothing store, a Bart's Menswear, Miami Springs, you know, you know, the Ciro and Gantt shirts and all that good stuff, <clears throat> Hart Schaffner and Mark suits. So I knew how to dress up. I cleaned up well. Uh, so I ended up being as comfortable, you know, in, in my PM side as I did in, in, in playing the cover. Um, you know, hosting parties, all these things are things that you have to do in order to meet people and go to cocktail parties. So the wives get very involved in this for us. Um, I'm, I'm blessed with a, a wife of 40 years now um, that um, truly believed in everything that I did because she was also Cuban. She's also Cuban. Oh, she wow. She went through yeah. the same thing that, 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 that I did. She left a little old, uh, older and a little later, and she's, she's about five years younger than I am. And, but so I, she understood. Never knew the details. My wife knows about my career now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. But she knew who, who, what I did, who I worked with and, and, and everybody else. So, yeah, I, the transition was easy. I, 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 I was very comfortable swapping from, from one activity to the other. Gosh. And I know we're going to jump a little bit here, but the, um, the group, I think it's called Alex Station, if I'm recalling correctly, with Mike Scheuer, is it? If, if I, he was actually a professor of mine in grad school. Um, but I feel like I might be mispronouncing the last name, but could you tell us what that, what that organization was and what your role was there? Yeah, it's, it's a great story. I, I had just come back um, and I was in CTC. I was uh, chief of the Palestinian branch, which I thought was cool as hell. I've always <laughs> admired the Israelis and, and knew what a handful they had, you know, the island in the sea of hostility kind of concept. And I was having a great old time. And about two months later, the chief of ops, which I became, you know, 15 years later, calls me in and, and he says, um, you know, your name has been put up for, to be the deputy chief of station uh, and senior ops officer to a virtual station. I go, what's a virtual station? I said, well, it's a new concept of when we have like a task force, instead of keeping it in the building where they are, sub, you know, subjugated to all these divisions, we put them outside of the building and you work like a station. You don't have to coordinate cables. You send cables and you send your stuff out. I'm going like, man, this is pretty cool. You know, here I am, you know, deputy chief of station and going to be working in a real station, but I still get to go home yeah. <laughs> to my wife's house in, in Fairfax, right? And uh, 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 Jeff says, uh, you know, you know, we this task force is going to be dedicated against one individual and in his growing organization. And I said, who? He goes, Osama bin Laden. I said, who? I had no idea. And what Mike year Schoen, is this, Rick? Mike what Schoen. year? Yeah. Say again. This was uh, 19, late 1995. We started yep. the actual unit real early 1996. 
Mike Sawyer knew the account, um, but of course he had other, uh, he was a branch chief, so he had other, or maybe even a group chief because he was an SIS officer. And uh, so um, that, that's, you know, that's the very same cell that umpteen years later uh, was able to uh, facilitate for our Navy SEALs to shoot Bin Laden in the face. Gosh, what, um, what was the energy like in that group as it started out? And, and please help set the context, right? So we're out of the, the Cold War. I mean, we're talking 95. Um, we've had some Black Hawk down. We're not at 9-11 yet. So what's it like working in this kind of counterterrorism space in this virtual station for the first time? It, it was uh, very innovative and it was like taking your, your handcuffs off. Um, no, nothing in this group was stupid. Uh, sometimes they would come up with things that I would go from the operational side and say, hey guys, great idea, but here's the downfall of that. That's why we cannot do this this way or whatever. Um, but but it, we had the freedom of reaching out to every CIA station in the world and asked them to help us with this question or that question as we were trying to make book and in, in, in lifestyle on Bin Laden. And it was, um, it became a very frustrating thing. The, the energy level was through the roof. I mean, Mike Shoyer, That's cool. we literally used to have to kick him out of the office at 630 because he was there at five o'clock in the morning and literally is just picking him up and putting him outside and closing the door because he didn't want to leave. So the work ethic was there, the enthusiasm was there. Um, we saw the writing on the wall. Um, you know, at, at the time, uh, Bin Laden was in, in, in Khartoum and the concentric circles of, of, our, of our world, uh, Kofor Black, who ended up being my boss and to this day, one of my best friends in CTC when I was cops, was the chief of station in, 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 uh, in Khartoum. That's right. And, a very, very dear friend of mine to this day, just talked to him two days ago, legendary Green Beret Billy Waugh, um, was the head of surveillance for, for Kofor in, in Khartoum. And he had photographs, he had a, he built a little safe house, hooch in, on top of some building, and he took photographs of Bin Laden. He would run across the camp, sizing up his guys, his guys were flipping him off. Uh, it was it was pretty pretty cool stuff. And Billy, uh, who's now 92 years old and has eight purple hearts. So he, he's had a rough ride. He always tells me, he says, Rick, Jacques could have killed him with a pencil. So the, 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 the irony is that we had eyes on uh, at a time when he was totally what we call in the white. He was, did not feel threatened. The Sudanese were protecting him. There was no natural predator there that could touch him or that he thought would touch him. So the plans that Billy kept proposing to Kofor and Kofor to through us to, to, to our seventh floor was let's grab this guy and bring him to justice. Because we by then we had intelligence, uh, we had overhead and intelligence of the camps that he was running, the kind of training that they were doing, um, the extortion of private sector individuals that they were playing, especially in Saudi Arabia and some of the other, like the Emirates and all this other stuff to contribute to these causes. And the plan that, that we kept proposing, besides shooting him, which obviously would have been the easiest, um, was to duct tape him. You know? And Billy said, look, I, I know ops. If we bring a 12-man team in here of any denomination, we can take this guy out of here and not, not suffer any losses. It was never palatable past, past our building. Uh, we, we kept saying, well, this is not the right time, or we don't know enough. And we're going like, we have 14 reporting sources. Two of them came out of these camps, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, and, and, the, and the sad thing about it is, and this goes back to my, my love for history, um, what would have happened if somebody would have put a bullet in Hitler's head in 1937? Different if world. We would have been able to duct tape him. If we would have done a rendition on, on Bin Laden in 1997, you got the coal, our embassies in, in Africa, uh, Cobar Towers, you know, you name it. Uh, yeah. And of course, maybe even 9-11 uh, that, that might have been averted. So I unfortunately had to leave this, the, uh, the, the station a little over a year after I was there. My wife developed a uh, temporary medical issue and I couldn't afford to be working 60 hour weeks like I was. And, and I had to pull the plug on that for a little bit. Uh, Mike Scheuer stuck with it for a very long time, uh, became very angry um very uh frustrated and 
he ended up being his own worst enemy because uh, he got into a major contest with the DCI. And I think it was uh, after, not after the coal, but it might have been after the embassies that, um, you know, one of these, you know, the blood, that this blood is in your hands. So. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we are a military organization. Uh, you can argue uh, with your seniors a lot more than you can in the military. But at the end of the day is, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. uh, so he kind of, you know, I mean, Mike, Mike Shorey would have been DCI. Yeah. He, he, I mean, he, he, could have, he could have been anything because uh, he had the brain, uh, the brain cells for it. But, uh, but anyway, plank owner of the very same unit. That That's amazing. Had Bin Laden. And then, and I got this right, right? You were COPS CTC on 9-11? I was Chief of Operations at the, the Counter-Terrorist Center. Uh, I took over and, uh, well, before that, I had a short Chief of Station tour, less than a year, just less than a year in a real, they didn't, they didn't allow me to talk about it, but we call it Shangri-La. And it's a radical Muslim country in Africa. So um, we, we can start pick picking pick. from there. Uh, and I had just come back as chief of station from that. That was another cowboys and Indians kind of thing. We were really uh, armored up in that town because it was, it was Indian territory. And I took over for uh, Hank Crumpton as chief of operations in May of uh, 2001. And of course, a few oh months after gosh. 11. Can you share with people what a chief of operations does? I know the connotation tied to it, but just so people can get an idea of what that role entails. Well, you figure in, in, in CTC, you had uh, four front office personnel. You had Colfer Black was the chief, the chief, the director of CTC. Ben Bonk was his primary deputy. Then there was a deputy for law enforcement who was always a SIS level FBI guy. And then there was a deputy for operations, I was the, the the real title is you know deputy chief CTC for operations, but we just yeah. call it cops. Cops. That, that was a yeah, cops chief ops, and uh, that that was you know we have our, our sections. You have the the analytical section, but under the ops section, everything from Hezbollah to Bin Laden to 17 November that is that was my domain. I owned all of that. Uh, I was responsible for all of that. Now, one thing that you learn real early on is you cannot micromanage in our organization. You have to know how to pick the right people, empower them uh, with the decision-making, putting parameters of when you come to me, but you cannot run. You know, I had several hundred people and I'm talking about three or 400 pre 9-11 after 9-11, yeah, after that, that doubled uh, immediately. So I had some incredible group chiefs uh, I had some incredible branch chiefs. So it was a very structure of dedicated people. And, you know, that, that is the reason that I, am, I was compelled. And I knew you're going to ask this anyway, but you know, I'm on my soapbox. Yeah. Uh, but I was compelled to do the book because what sticks in my craw is how badly our agency is, is uh, represented by Hollywood and how maligned are our officers. Uh, they're always portrayed as these treacherous, backstabbing, alcoholic, drug selling, blah, 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 Jason Bourne or American made kind of uh, examples. And, you know, you know, you know, the culture, it's yeah. a highly moral culture. It's a very dedicated culture. It's people that have a love and patriotism. And that's what I try to paint in the book, not just things that I was able and blessed to do, but the bosses that I had and the kind of decisions that they made and my peers and my colleagues, the things that they did that were above and beyond the call of duty. So it, it's so true. Um, I get this a lot where people will listen to 99% uh, of the people who listen to this podcast, get it. They completely get it. Every now and then we'll have somebody who, who leaves some really snarky comment about like, you're a baby killer and the CIA does all these illegal things, but th but they revere the guys who are in Delta or dev crew or Rangers. And, and, and I get it, but these, like the stuff that you did on your own, I, they just don't know it because we can't talk about it, but just the, so I'm glad you wrote the book to, to your point so, to get an idea of like, you're really hanging it out there on your own in the middle of nowhere, just trying to help people. So people don't see it that often, but I put it right up there with everything that we talk about with these units that go out with 15 people to hit a target. Like you're out on your own a lot of the time. It's a very noble profession. 
Yeah. And I consider it a vocation and for me, a blessing. Um, I think that uh, the, the people that gravitate towards the agency like yourself are wired a little different than, than the average um, Joe in the, on the street. Um, but it is, it is a very rewarding work. It's also very demanding work because, you know, imagine as, a, as an operations officer in that Latin American country, again, another one that I could not speak to, uh, could not speak the name, but I could say that I recruited a terrorist from a Maoist group in, in South America. So uh, some people <laughs> will figure it out. But, you know, here I am working at the embassy. Uh, I'm a third secretary or second secretary, I think, by then. And, you know, Johnny's little dad, you know, little Johnny's dad gets off at five and Tommy's dad gets up at five and Rick Prado gets off at five, goes home, changes clothes, goes back out, doesn't come. And then you go to work. Yeah. yeah. That's when, when I, you know, I, now is when I go do my either developmental or actually agent handling stuff. You could do some of the developmental during the day because the, the social aspects of things. Um, so that's tough on the kids and it could be very tough on, on, the, on the wife. My wife, again, never did she complain, never gave her a reason to. But, you know, it's, it's very easy for me with my tradecraft to say, hey, I, I got an agent meeting tonight. I That's right. Go down to, to the bar and have some drinks and watch girls dance on the studio that, you know, so um, it, it, it makes for for problematic marriages. Uh, we move every two or three years uh, more than than most other agencies, because, again, we have a shelf life before your fig leaf starts to wear in any given country. Uh, it's, it's always a good time to, you know, to, to go while you're still uncompromised. So, yeah. Rick, is there any particular op that you're on without getting into the details of sources and methods, but just um, in terms of like, maybe you were, you were worried about it at the outset or something really dangerous happened during your op. And I'm thinking more on the traditional side as you're going out to meet a source or you're working a developmental and you just felt like um, something wasn't right that you still think back to. You know, uh, obviously, you know, my, my early kinetic years were, were, were very, very different in, uh, than what I ended up doing. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it, it's funny because I've, I've been asked a lot of times, you know, how nervous were you before this? I said, look, I didn't, I'm nervous until I switch. Once, once the game is on, you know, you, you, you have to have it. And uh, in this particular country in Latin America, we had uh, a terrible t a terrorism problem. They were literally in the, in the capital, kidnapping and burning buildings. And there were two, two uh, communist back, but, you know, uh, terrorist groups, narco-terrorist groups. And through our contacts and developmentals and everything else, we knew that there was this one safe house that was being used by a cell. A, a, a terrorist cell. And so we came up with, uh, we recruited the, uh, the, uh, the young lady that lived the house. These guys would literally just go in and say, get the hell out of the house and use her house for meetings. So she told her boyfriend who told somebody and, you know, eventually got to us. So we made, uh, now we, um, somebody in the station, we always have a tech in the station. He made this rustic table, uh, and one leg was hollowed out. It's got all the batteries in it. And then it's got microphones on, on either end. And all she had to do when these guys knocked on the door, take this little nail and pull it out and, 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 and leave it and, uh, and go out. And now we had audio. But in order to get that audio, we had to run what's called a path loss test. You know, these have to be le free, uh, low frequency um, transmissions because you don't want them making, you know, uh, static on, on TVs and all this other stuff. So they, we had an observation listening post that in a building above it. And my job was to go and walk in front of this uh, safe house <laughs> and push this button that is transmitting to them so they could go through the spectrum. This is all Ouija board stuff for me. So, but the thing is, this is a real bad neighborhood. So I literally did not bathe for two or three days. I didn't shave for two or three days. I had some local clothes. I looked like just a, 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 a you know, an Indian, you know, uh, native kind of thing. And I had my I had, you know, it was, it was kind of cool. So I had a, a little jacket on. I had my Browning high power, one spare mag. And I have a bag over my shoulder with my left hand. I'm hitting this button. And my, my buddy, my, 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 the guy that was my backup, 
dropped me off in the corner because he was a tragically white guy with a, you know, he had a fake, <laughs> you know, ponytail, but, you know, kind of thing under his hat and glasses. So he drops me off in the corner and I walk back, but he's got eyes on me. And I literally, when I'm in front of the door, the door bursts open and five of these guys come out and literally bump into me. Not only do they bump into me, they start giving me a ration of crap. Now, I don't tend to take crap and I have 15 rounds plus 15 more. For a 10th of a second, I thought I could take all five of you assholes out. But the point of the story is in our, in our world, the minute you draw your weapon, that, uh, that operation is done. So I literally went into peasant mode Oh, por favor, no me de perdona, perdona. And I just, while well, they're laughing, you know, they, they had a soccer ball. They were going to play soccer on the street. And poetic justice, we were able to get, you get the, the audio work. We got the intel. We were able to wrap that cell up. They were actually targeting the embassy. That's awesome. Uh, God. Cool. These are, yeah. It's just so funny. Like these are the, some of the, the cr not crazy, but the, I guess common almost in the end, these ops that are really creative and audacious that you just have to run. And whoever's there, you, like Rick, go walk in front of this building, and press this button. Okay. You do what you got to do. But you know, Ryan, here's, here's what really angers me about Hollywood. Every story that I've put in my book is number one, cleared by the agency. Number two, true. And number three, sexy and pretty cool. Yeah. Why can't Hollywood duplicate that? Why can't, why do they have to have this, this, you know, conspiracy theories all the time, but you, you hit on something that's very personal to me is I'm an average operations officer. We no, have no, no. Guys. Well, I, I tell you, I, I grew up in the shadow of giants. You know, uh, when, when you, when your mentors are guys like Colonel Ray and Dewey Claridge and some of the PM guys, you know, Bill Buckley, who I only, fortunately for me, I got to meet him once. Um, some of the individuals that I work with, like I said, Ray Doty, I mean, he jumped into Corregidor at the age of 18, for God's sake, you know? So um, it, it makes you humble and it should keep you humble because I know what our officers do in and outside the building. And, and, and one of the stories that, 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 that uh, if I may want to give you as Please. a highlight, um, right after 9-11, I mean, we're talking on 9-11, uh, we all know exactly where we were on 9-11, and hair's on fire, we're directing traffic, trying to get more people, you know, tearing up uh, conference rooms and putting, making them into cubicles, all this kind of stuff is going on. And I slept in my office for three days after 9 11. So, it. first night, I'm walking back up to my office to take a nap. And here is my deputy of Hezbollah branch, a female, and she's seven and a half to eight months pregnant. And I looked at her, and her name is Christy. Her name is Christy. And I went to her and I said, uh, What the hell are you doing here? She says, Well, you know, Boss, you know, before 9-11, Hezbollah had killed more Americans than anybody else. We're not sure yet that this, this is not their doing. And I told her, I said, look, Christy, um, I've delivered two kids in my life during my paramedic days. Neither one of them was mine. I ain't about to have a third. You're going home. <laughs> and the moral of the story, because she and I, we, we're still in touch. We talked uh, later on. She told me one day that, Every, every time her daughter has her birthday, she thinks of me. Wow. And the reason I say this, Ryan, is because there is no stronger courage than a mother's preservation of her child. A, a mother will do yeah, anything agreed. to save her child. And here you have a woman who's almost eight months pregnant of her first and only child. They had hit the Pentagon. They had hit our economic center. They had hit our military. And a lot of people thought the agency was also on, that, on yeah. the target board to the point that the building was evacuated. All of CIA was evacuated except for CTC. Yeah. Wolfer came out and said, anybody that needs to go home to get their kids, go home. I understand. I'm staying. And of course, I'm staying. And 
here is Christy. It, you know, so it, yeah. if, if you can override that, if you could rather than that, that maternal instinct for God and country, that I think crystallizes, at least in my heart, the kind of people we have in my office. In it's our so life. true. It's so true. I, I had a, um, when I was a company commander in Afghanistan, I had a female platoon leader in my unit. She came over three months after giving birth to her first child, like insisted on being over there and fighting. Like, I'm not missing this. I'm not sitting out. Um, I'm, I'm going to be in the fight here. And she was a gun pilot, a great one. So God bless oh, you. Man, that's so cool. Um, just before we wrap up here, I wanted to ask, and, and maybe one day you'll let me do a round two, Rick. I know people listening to this are going to be like, you didn't even scratch the surface. And I know this, but I just wonder if, if there was any time that you were under surveillance on an op that you noticed it and how you felt if you did. Yeah, I mean, there were there was a couple of times, you know, for us, the, the, the beauty of it is once you detect surveillance, you just avoid, you cannot drag them with you to a meeting. It's not like in the movies, you don't do a reverse 180 and crash through cars and, no. and then go pick up your guy because again, now you're, you're done. You're, you, they know that you are indeed a spy. Um, and, and one of the things that we are taught and one of the things that I've always taught and, and I've taught a lot of our special operations guys is that awareness is key in our, in, 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 our, in our environment. You know, we have to be aware of what's going on around us. You have to have the discipline. And did I have surveillance? I, sure, in Shangri-La, saw them all the time. We would just abort. We would just bore them to death. They couldn't afford the gas, we could. So I would take them on a 50 <laughs> mile that. trip or all over town and they're like going like, hey, we, we, we're out of gas kind of stuff. But the awareness part is something that I wanna, that I wanna emphasize because there was an incident in the, in the Philippines. Uh, we were in Davao. And in the Philippines, I was there from 90 to 92. Uh, I went in there something like seven months or so uh, after Nick Rowe, Colonel Nick Rowe was assassinated on the streets of Manila. Um, and either when I got there or just before, two Air Force, uh, one officer, one enlisted were, were, were shot in Angeles City. Um, which is outside of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the Air Force Base there, Clark Air Force Base. And the, the guys doing the hits were these guys called the Sparrows. The uh, New People's Army, MPA, had a team of, they call them Sparrows. And they were assassins. They were brutal assassins. We didn't know, know what their MO was. We just knew that people were getting killed and nobody saw them. They were ghosts. One was captured and he under some interrogation, I'm sure, uh, decided to cooperate and demonstrated what their modus operandi was. They would have two guys, minimum. They carry a 1911 A1 45 caliber pistol in their, in their what we now call appendix carry, but it was stuck in their pants, no, no holster, <laughs> safety, the, the grip safety taped down. And what they would do is they would, with the left hand, they would hold a pistol. And when they would come to the target, they would push the pistol up, grab it, shoot, put it back in and walk off. And that's why nobody could see them. So we had been working with uh, two uh, Philippine army intel guys. And we had two of our techs. Who, uh, we had a very robust SIGINT capability that we were trying to build for them to help them with their insurgency problems. And we went to dinner in Davao. We come out of the, out of the place, restaurant, bar kind of thing. We've had a couple of beers and we walk out six of us, we walk out, the two officers, my two techs, me and my partner, uh, uh, Davis, is another case officer, Vietnam vet. We're the last two, I'm the last guy out. And as soon as I walk out, I, I see in the corner of my eye, I see three guys, they're in a huddle and they're talking to each other. As soon as we walk out, they made eye contact. They got three abreast. The two guys outside have their hands in their, in their, in their, in their, in their pocket. Their, their left hand in their pocket and the guy in the middle is got he's boring a hole into my face again auditory exclusion tunnel vision i i, I pull out my weapon and i pointed it at him now if if you're an innocent individual and somebody pops up and points a gun at you you know this is the reaction you yeah. expect these guys didn't even blink and the one guy in the middle as we were walking by he kept looking at me and going like, okay. You've been and you were drawn on him. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Me. Yeah. And, and the funny thing was, as soon as, of course, as soon as it cleared, you know, look around, make sure that I can put my weapon away. And I look over and, and Davis had actually also seen it. He was putting his weapon away. The two techs and the two locals never saw the threat. Wow. Yeah. So the moral of the story, awareness beats fast draw every single time. That's true. And uh, so um, that, that, that was, and it was part of a surveillance. Obviously they had been surveilling us. They saw where we were at and they decided they were going to try to whack us when we came out of, Jeez. you know, and we knew we were a natural target, but there was only a handful of us helping the Philippine government and the Philippine government was kicking serious butt there. Well, what's the best way to disrupt that? Go after the source. And we were the source. So, yeah. Look, people should check out Black Ops. Um, for And we, we've rattled off a lot of names here, Hank Crumpton and Cofer Black. And I mean, so many of them have left glaring reviews of you. Um, so I know you say that you're in the shadow of giants, but they're all saying what a great um, operator you were and leader and um, leaving, like they left things to you. They wouldn't entrust to anyone else like CTC in, in uh, the 9-11 timeframe. So there's so much credibility that goes with it. There's two questions, Rick, I ask everybody before I let them go. Um, one is, was there anything that you carried with you? And now this could be from your first, like as a PMOO or just running regular ops, something that you carried with you on ops or missions that you had that was like sentimental value, something that somebody gave you or that was important that you have with you? I, uh, my patron say, uh, say Lazarus, uh, I always had that around my neck, no matter what I'm doing, no matter what I'm doing. Uh, I am a Christian. Uh, I do believe in God. I talk to him every day. I'm not much of a church goer, but I am a very religious guy, a very spiritual guy when it comes to that. And I believe, you know, in, in, especially in my life, convinces me that God had a path for me and he forged my metal with those early experiences and, and facilitated bumping into that pararescue guy. Because if I had not been a medic, I would have not been able to get into the agency because I was, a, you know, I was a blunt object and so on and so on and so on. So uh, for me to believe in, in a higher, in, in the fact that I'm still here, you know, like most of us who've been in harm's way, you, you know that they, 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 what's the, there's no atheists in foxholes. That's right. Um, so yeah, I, I always wore my St. Lazarus uh, medal and, and a crucifix, you know. Was that from family? Uh, it was, uh, the, the, the St. Lazarus was uh, my mom's favorite saint. And so that, that's how I got indoctrinated into that. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm wearing them right here. I mean, yep, I love it. They are, you know, both yep. the crucifix and the St. Lazarus. So that's great. And what then, the, the question? <laughs> yeah, the next question is as you look back at all the time that you spent time in harm's way, time away from family, um, would you go back and do that again? In an atrial flutter, which is about a quarter of a heartbeat. Never heard that one. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm a medic. You see, there you that's go. What an atrial flutter is, is a quarter of a heartbeat. Um, you know, I, I'm 71 years old. I'm still pretty fit. I've been blessed with good health. Um, so it's, it's that old, uh, country song. I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm good once as I ever was. Yeah. Uh, I, I still think this, this dog can hunt. Um, but you know, 51 years of between military reserves, uh, medic and 25 years, 24 and a half years in the agency. I did seven years after the agency doing exactly the same thing in support of, of our community, only doing it uh, as a contractor, you know, as an SME. So, and I'm, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about being out in recruiting yeah. and, and doing surveillance and doing all kinds of stuff. So it comes a time when you have to first take care of, of those who took care of you. And that's my wife. Um, also, you know, my parents, when they were alive, um, my dad lived with me for the last five years of his life. And that's precious. Um, that's when I really started curtailing uh, my, my work. And, and uh, you know, I still do some training, uh, it's our special operations training, some of the gun, uh, gun, uh, gun fighting stuff. And then the trade craft, how we marry that into the low vis world that the military is trying to get into, all that kind of stuff. But uh, would I go? Yeah. And, and, and don't get me wrong. If, if, if I'm called upon to do something that would be my duty to do, my wife would be the first one that would say, clear it out. That's awesome. 
Yeah. The, the book is great because so many, uh, I recommend it to people because so many of the books that you can find are written by former um, leaders of the CIA at, a, at the strategic level. But this is like, this is what it's like to be in the agency is through your eyes in the book. So thank you so much, Rick, for the time. I really appreciate it. Maybe one day you'll let me do a round two, uh, but this was a blast. It, it makes me reminisce on those days, the short ones that I had there. Well, you, you understand it better than most. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed today's combat story. For those who want a little more of this interview with Rick, please check out our Patreon combat story community where Rick shares what he found to be the hardest training course he ever went through. And this is from a psychological and physical perspective. And remember, he went through all the training that the agency has and so many of the toughest training courses in the military as a PJ. His answer is not exactly what I was expecting. And you can find that and more photos of Rick, who I think might actually be the world's most interesting man, at www.patreon.com slash combat story. Our first comment today is from a YouTube response to the Daryl Utt video. It's from Airborne. It says, great podcast, Ryan. Thank you for bringing these badasses on to talk about their experience. Incorporating the pictures like you have is a great addition. Keep up the good work, sir. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Daryl's interview was a great one, as we've talked about before. But to your point on the pictures, um, for those who don't know on Patreon, I do put all of the pictures that I get from the guests up there so you can see them. Only a few of them make the cut for the interview itself and social media. But there are so many others that... Um, give you a glimpse into what their careers were like when they were downrange with family today. Um, so it can be pretty cool to check those out if you're interested. Our next comment is also from YouTube and it's on the Farida Mohammadi interview. It's from Ava M. It says, thank you for shining light on the courage and sacrifices of these female warriors. Incredible story. And uh, again, for those who didn't see it, this was Farida, who was part of the female tactical platoons in Afghanistan, literally running um, operations with our elite special ops teams from the US with the Afghans on the objective as a female. Completely unheard of, very small group of women. I'm sure it's gonna be a movie one day. Thanks for the comments, y'all. Stay safe.